your finished version of it, okay? Um, so, the way we started ours, we started off with a polygon object, and polygons are great because you can just grab faces and delete them, but obviously you get weird stuff like we had. So this way we would start off with a NURBS. And a NURBS sphere is actually a um, mathematical sphere. It's kind of like a Bezier curve where you have a point here and a point there and it automatically creates this like rounded shape. Okay, that's what you can consider like a NURBS uh, sphere. So I'm gonna rotate this and pay attention to your hotkeys too, like actually read through them, not just like before the test um, or right before the test. Um, there's hotkeys for like snapping when you rotate so that it rotates to like a perfect 90. Uh, cool. It is cool. Mm -hmm. All right. So what I need to do is I have in our instance, we want to cut out a circle of the center of this. And we also want to cut out that little rim around it and make them both even. So I'm going to switch to my front view and I'm going to create a curve. So I'm going to use an EP curve. An EP curve allows me to create a straight line. Okay. Um, other curves let me do it too, but it's a lot, um, a lot more involved, a lot more point clicking. So I'm going to click one point, hold down shift, click the other point. There we go. Okay. So now I have this line that I could just move wherever. Then I'm going to create a NURBS circle. I'm going to rotate it 90 degrees. So it's facing the camera. And this is going to be like the size of the opening. So however big I want that lens area to be, that's how big that's going to be. This here, this uh, edge here is half the thickness of that because eventually it's going to be duplicated underneath. And so we'll have like two of those. So just keep that in mind. So I'm going to take uh, all three of these items. I'm going to go under my modeling menu and we're not dealing with meshes. Meshes are polygons, so none of that stuff applies. I'm gonna go over to surfaces, and there's this area here where it says project curve on surface. So I'm gonna take this curve and actually project it right onto the surface. I just have to make sure my settings are correct. Active view is on what I need to make sure of. I'm gonna sniffle, there we go. Uh, I'm gonna switch to my perspective view, and you'll see that I projected um, this curve right along that circle and then this curve along the back. I don't need the one along the back And now what I'm going to do is grab the um, sphere go back to the surfaces menu and say I want to trim this And all I have to do is click on the part. I want to keep so I say keep this one and I hit enter So now it creates a perfectly flat bottomed rounded shape Okay, now the downside of this is that it's NURBS meaning that I cannot take this into Mari if I export this as an OBJ, it's going to do some funky stuff to it, and then it won't work correctly. Also, you can't do like, there's different items here, so I can't do like a face extrude or anything like that. So I'm going to go to modify, and I'm going to convert this into a polygon. So way up here at the top, NURBS to polygons, option box. I'm going to just reset this. Good. Okay. So the default settings give you a piece of crap, which is this. Oops like that. That looks pretty horrible. Uh, we don't like triangles on anything, so we want everything to be quads. So I always click quads. Now, if I leave again the default settings, um, this actually does produce an okay version uh, of this. So that's actually like, in this case, it's usable. I like to make sure that my, my settings are pretty the same every time I do this. So I always do quads general and then I change these two to per span. That's typically the only changes I ever make to this. Quad general per span. And what it does, it gives me this shape, which looks exactly like the other shape, but in some instances it won't. In some instances um, it doesn't do a good job. And it didn't actually do a good job here. I have to delete that. These should not be here. I'm going to go to mesh because now it's a polygon or edit mesh and say delete. Where are you at? Delete. There we go. Okay. So cool. So now, uh, the cool thing is, like we talked before about history, right? So it saves everything we've done. If I were to go through, and hopefully this won't crash, uh, maybe I should save first. Uh, ball herbs. Make sure this goes into my scenes folder. Yes, good. Uh, if I were to go and start scaling this, you can see how that one just flickered a little bit and then my system froze. Uh, that means it was updating it. So everything I did, I created a nerve sphere, I created the circle, I created the line, I projected them, I trimmed them, I converted the nerve shape to a polygon, 
it updates everything so that when I change any one of these aspects, when I change this circle, it changes both of them. When I change the height of the line, it would change both of them, okay? Now because it froze and I saved it before it did, um, I can just trash this. Sometimes it'll do that just because it doesn't know what to do. It's like that's too much stuff. I don't know what you're doing. So now before I do any changes, I need to delete the history. So that's what I talked about before deleting history. That way when I start moving stuff and scaling stuff, it doesn't update and then crash my station. Sometimes history is good, sometimes it's bad like that. So what I need to do is it keeps both of them. So even though I converted it, it keeps the old one. I don't need any of this stuff, so I can just delete it. And I can just shove that back. But now that I have this, now it's pretty much the exact same steps that we took to get here, right? So we did an extrusion on this. We added some thickness. It's too thin. That's good. Okay. Uh, we added our lens here. We flipped it over. We added the little rim around the side. So everything else would be obviously um, the same after this point. And you could then see that this shape is a perfect sphere. So there's no issue of it not. Okay. So now you have a perfect sphere, and then this line, if I turn my grid off, you can see it, goes perfectly straight all the way across, okay? So that's another way that this project could have been done. I just didn't want to get into NURB stuff um, right away. All right, so now let me jump into Mari, and I will open up Pokeball here. I think that's the one I was working on. No, you're just doing one. Yep. All right. So, let me click off of this. Um, I also recommend I don't have a hotkey sheet for Mari, um, but definitely check one out online. Download one. Why aren't you selecting? Oh, I have my mask on. There we go. So there's my um, Pokeball. That's all textured. Okay. And you can see the amount of layers that I added to this just to oh, my screen is so tiny. Uh, move you no. There we go. So it's a little bit taller. Uh, so you can see the amount of layers that I have here that go into taking this shape from just a solid red and blue and white, which is there to then adding a bit of coloration to it. So there's some red splotches, or some dark splotches on the red. There's some lighter coloring on top of that. And then there's some other metallic material on top of that. And then just some little spots on it, okay? So once you have all your stuff painted, then we have to export it out, okay? So the process is we've modeled it inside of Maya we bring it into Mari to do any texture painting. Now all we need to do is take the texture and bring it outside of Mari so we can apply it back inside Maya, okay? Now with any of this, we're using Maya, you could use any software. So if we're taking this into um, Unreal Engine or taking this into Cinema or wherever, we could do that. So here's my one channel, which is my color channel. It's under the channels here. So I'm gonna right click and just say export the flattened version. And I just say export all channels flattened. You could export each layer on each channel out. And what that will do is every single one of those layers that I have, it'll separate. So then I could bring that into Photoshop and manually adjust them. Let's say I didn't like how much metal I added. I could subtract some of that metal or add it to it or whatever. Adjust the coloration of the red and the blue. Okay. So I'm just going to drop this into my source images. So I went and found my source images folder. There it is. And then I would say export. Do not change any of this stuff here. Don't rename any of these. This dollar sign channel dot dollar sign layer dot dollar sign UDIM dot TIFF. That's how it's going to rename all of our stuff. If we change anything, it will ruin the entire world. Um, and because I've already done this, I'm going to make a new folder and call it um, new export. Okay, then I will say export all patches. So now what it's going to do is it's going to go through each one of those patches 
and export out the texture for each one. A patch is essentially, uh, remember we took the UVs and we laid them out into that grid? So each one of those is a patch. So it's exporting out that many textures. So in this case, I had five patches. One, two, three, four, five. Yeah, five patches. In some cases, like if you're doing a character, you may have like 30 patches. Um, I've seen even more than that, but that's typically um, a lot of patches. And this process, you can see, is not a quick one. It's still going. You might think it's crashed. It's not crashed. It just takes a minute. And while it's taking a minute, um, I'm going to open up Nuke. And I will also open up my file browser and I will also go down here. Nope, it's on my desktop. That's where it is. 20 product image uh, source images. It's still exporting. You're still thinking about this. Yeah. There it is. Bam. <laughs> All right. So there's my five textures, and you can see there's my red and my blue. Um, pieces so this is like one's the top one's the bottom uh, one is one part of the, my middle section one's the other part of my middle section and then one is like the lens area okay so I export out five of these you'll also notice that it labeled them correctly so this is color that's the color channel that we exported it's flattened and then this is one zero zero one this refers to back inside of here if I open up my Pokeball, I believe it was that one. Oh, I didn't save. Oh well. Uh, do not display my image. There we go. Okay. So right now it's showing. Um, one zero zero one one zero zero two one zero zero three and then it jumps from one zero eleven and one zero twelve okay those numbers um, the one zero is nothing you can just ignore that the other one the zero one and the zero two and the one one and the one two is basically like a grid uh, pattern or a grid uh, location so this is zero zero right here so, or zero one, sorry. This one is zero one right here. This is zero two. This is zero three. This one, we go up one, and it's one, 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 two. So that's what these mean. So uh, zero one, zero two, zero three, one, one, and one, two. So that just tells it basically where to go once it's done. So now I'm going back into Maya and I need to assign all of that material information to this object. So I'm gonna go under Render Man, I'm gonna go to Materials, and this is the awesome thing about Render Man 21 compared to the other versions, is that there's only one here, okay? Now, just to take this even a step further of how awesome Render Man is, if you click on this little icon, which is like a, um, a rendering icon, <clears throat> it brings up the preset browser and the preset browser has presets so if you're like I want to start off with something that looks kind of silvery and go from there you can totally do that so I grab all this stuff I right click on I don't know mercury and then I say import and assign to selected so now this looks like mercury if I were to render it out not really but maybe okay now what I have to do is hit Control A on one of these pieces, go to the Mercury, and I have to load in my pictures on top of this, okay? So here's that Mercury material. I need to load in my image right here so that my texture is there, not this metal color. So I click on the little mappy button. It's gonna say, what do you wanna map to this? There it is. I say, map a file. And then here I just load the folder. Now, just like you saw a second ago, I'll go into there. I have five files here, right? So how do I know which one to add? It doesn't matter, you click on any one. Okay, Maya's actually gotten really smart about this. Now, this is gonna look horrible, like that isn't what we wanted. 
because what's happening is that texture is applied to every piece the exact same way. So we have to tell it, this is a Mari texture, fix it for me. So if you look, go to UV tiling, all you have to do is say, this is a Mari texture, and then you say, fix it for me. And then what it's gonna do is automatically offset each one of those textures to their correct location, and then it matches just like we saw inside Mari. Awesome. Super cool, okay? Now, if I were to render this, it'll probably come out black because I don't think I have a light in the scene. We'll do it just for fun. Maybe we'll do it just for fun. That's the render button too, I don't think I skipped that. So that's the render button inside Maya. And what should happen is that it should open up a window in a second and then we'll see it. There it goes. The first time always takes like forever, I don't know why. Oh, I know why. I have to escape a bunch of times because I had some settings in here that I definitely did not want. Yes, close that program. Don't care about that. Go my settings. And this is the other kind of weird thing about Maya. <clears throat> it actually remembers where your windows are. So on my laptop, I don't usually work at this resolution. So my windows are actually like way down here because my resolution is so big. So I have to shrink this up. There it is. Then I have to go into my Maya version again. Then I have to bring these over so I can see it. And then I can shrink my window down again. So like, let's say you have dual screens at home. If you move all your windows over to one screen, you copy your preferences, it remembers your windows are on the other screen, even if you have one screen. So you have to be aware of that. It's a stupid thing, but it works, whatever. Okay, so I just have to take off all these passes on here that I don't need. That's why mine was taking a longer time to start. All right, so now when I hit render, it shouldn't take nearly as long just to actually render the thing out. There it goes. Okay, so there's my rendering. And you can see, obviously, this isn't anything at all. It looks horrible. Um, so I need to add lights. Now, here's another cool thing. Under the light rigs in the same content browser, there's three different light rigs. So I can just right-click on any one of these and say import. You don't assign it. You just import it. Right? So now this creates lights in my scene. The biggest one is your main light, so that's basically where your light source is coming from. Okay. Now, when I rendered it out also, you'll see that the texture is black. All right. So let me jump back to the material and take a look. So when we use a preset, it comes in with some certain things already defined. One of the things it defined was the fact that my diffuse, which is uh, another word for it, is just your color, is set to zero. Basically, don't get any information from the diffuse. In order for us to have something reflective like a mirror or chrome, that doesn't have its own color. So you would have no um, actual color. So if I crank this up, now I should get my color. There it is. Awesome. Okay, so what this is doing is it's taking um, multiple passes. It goes through like once and then again and then again, and it's constantly like refining the image. And eventually it'll stop doing its thing in like 1%. There it goes. And now it's done. Now we'll notice a couple things about this. One of them is that my, um, my specularity is like incredibly hot. Um, these areas here are like super bright. With the default settings, they just come in like that, okay? So what I have to do is I have to go back to my attribute editor and let me just shrink some of these down. There we go. So I know that my primary specular, which is my, my reflectivity and that bright white spot, that's where this is gonna be coming from. So I'm going to take this down a bit and then I'm gonna take my roughness up a little bit. 
Okay, so something like that, let's say. Oops, that's not the right button. That button. So now just by adjusting those settings, you can see we get a much softer reflection on this, so we're not like blowing out the um, reflections. Now it looks pretty flat also. When we bring in a, a picture on top of our stuff, it's basically just a flat image on top of it. It doesn't actually have any like depth to it. So what we want to do is we want to add a bump map to this. So under our primary specular, um, under the advanced tab, there's this little bump node right here. I'm going to click on the little bump node and I want to connect a file to it. And I'm going to go to my folder and I'm going to grab that same image and hit open. And then I'm going to go to my UV tiling, say Mari, say generate preview. And then close that and then render it again. And then what this should do is it should then take my brightness values. Okay, so wherever it's bright on my image, it'll be one bumpy value. And then wherever it's dark, it'll be another bumpy value. So what we should get is something that looks a bit more um, variated, as, except for this big, like, smooth uh, specular. So if we look at the before, you can see how the specular is just, like, right on top of that surface. If we look at it now, it's a little bit more distributed throughout it. It feels like it might be actually kind of like dirty, okay? So that's pretty much all we have to do for that specific item. You can get in a little bit deeper into this too. Um, in my uh, end image that I have, let me go to this. Uh, lower this quality down even further, even further. You're taking forever. There it is. All right, maybe I'll take it up a little bit more now. So in this one that I did, I actually used um, those same color maps and I connected them to different areas. So if we look at this here, under our primary specular, um, the reflectivity would not be the same on the smooth areas as it would on the rough areas, okay? Our reflectivity would be changing. So if you have a Mac laptop, this is a really good example, and you put the case down, um, you look at the Mac icon, that icon is super reflective, but then the rest of the case is like a brushed metal, okay? Very similar to that is what I'm talking about. So these two properties have different reflection values. So to the um, reflectivity here, and the edge color roughness, or sorry, the roughness here, I could apply different maps that would allow me to control where is the um, shininess, where is not. Should we go into the other row? Okay, so you can get more detailed into this and really control where that specular is and where the other stuff is. For your first project, don't worry about it, okay? For this first one, just go into it and then just like do the two, do the bump and do your um, diffuse and then just adjust some of that specularity so it doesn't look like bananas. Okay, now for some of the other stuff that I added, too many windows, there we go. Uh, remember all those little lenses that I created before? So what I did was I just kind of picked, I just basically deleted this one because I didn't like that one and then I used that one. Now this is um, some cool stuff that we can do. If I can just move this out of the way. What was that? No, because these ones I'm not painting textures. I'm just giving them color, okay? So if I'm simply giving something color, um, I don't need to go into Mari for that. So for these little orbs here, I went under Render Man and I went to Lights and I actually assigned a mesh light to these. And so what that means is that each one of those little things is now like a light. So then can you, change the color? you can. So then it looks like that. And I think like, hey, that's cool. Okay. So then I went to my um, what did I do? I clicked on that. Oh, I clicked on this arrow. There we go. And now I have a color. So then I can just give this, let's say, green or blue or whatever color. Okay. So now if I were to just render this, uh, well, let's add some more stuff, I guess. So we'll just do that. Uh, this thing here, I could go back under Render Man, go back to Materials. Um, what am I doing? Why do we have the content browser if we're not going to use it, right? <laughs> 
Um, what is this? Let's say it's probably like a hard plastic. So if I went to a glossy plastic, there we go, and I import and assign it, done. And then this one is probably going to be like a glassy material. So if I go to glass, um, I like this frosted one. I'll just change the color of it. So I go into the glass section, I go to the color, and then I give it a color, blue. And then this is going to be my lens. You sit right about there. Yep, uh, maybe a little bit smaller. I think it might be a little bit too big. Yeah, you were definitely sticking out. There we go. And then that one will be just a regular, like, solid thin glass, or a clear glass. There we go. All right, so now we'll take a look at this and see. We hit render. We open this up. That looks pretty cool. Okay, and obviously this blue that I chose here, maybe that's a little bit too dark. I could boost that up. I could also go to my diffuse and add some color into the diffuse, and then make sure that's there too to give myself a little bit of color. Anytime you're uh, assigning materials, you're basically trying to coerce the, the computer into giving you what you want. So here, um, this blue was obviously a bit too dark, so I can go to my diffuse. I can put that blue here, and then just add a little bit of gain. Okay, so maybe it was just too transparent is what the uh, idea there was. Just go back to this. Oh, much better. See, just a little tweaking. Now your um, reflections will also depend on the angle that we're looking at this. So if I'm at a 45 degree angle looking down, I'm going to get different reflections than if I'm headed straight at it. Okay, so just be aware of that. If you don't like where these reflections are, just try moving your camera and sometimes you'll just pick up uh, better reflections in other areas. All right, so I'm going to hit escape and I'm just going to minimize that. All right, cool. So our materials are done, our lights are done. If we needed to adjust any lighting, we could just grab one of these guys and hit control A. And then we could adjust stuff like the intensity, the exposure. We could give it a little bit of a color too if you needed it for your specific look. Um, there's other stuff inside here too you could also play with. All right, but he's pretty much done. Now for the rendering of this, um, I want you to, oops, you're gonna click on this little geary render button. We're gonna give this a name, uh, render, oops. call it Pokeball, Sarcona underscore Pokeball, there you go. Uh, we're gonna save it as an EXR, that'll be a, just a common thing we save our stuff as. Um, we're rendering from our perspective camera because we're just gonna move our camera into position. Our final file size will be um, 33,000 by 2400. I passed out cheat sheets last time, right? Yep, so on your cheat sheet, it has that resolution. So make sure you look at that. This is gonna be a uh, landscape, not a portrait picture, okay? Uh, so 3,000 by 2,400. Uh, under my sampling here, this is one option you may have to change. So remember when I hit the render button and all those red things are going all over the place? Those are my samples. So the bigger this number is, the more samples there are. So let's say that you rendered your stuff out and just as an example, I'm zoomed in. Let's say it looked like that grainy when you were zoomed out, okay? I'm zoomed in, so it's gonna look grainy, but when I'm back here at 100, if it looks that bad, I need to start cranking up those settings. Or if this texture starts to look too fuzzy, maybe, um, it could be an issue with the samples, okay? So then you would just increase this. And basically you don't go like 129 or 130, you try to like double it basically. So I would go to like 256, okay? So mine was good at 128. I'm just gonna leave it at 128. All right, and then everything else in here should be good. Oops, no, sorry. I have to go to passes and I have to add a Z pass, okay? So I'm gonna go to the Z pass and just arrow it over, okay? Um, this Z pass is a depth pass because I actually wanna get the depth of how far from the camera my object is and how far each piece of my object is from the camera. And just to accentuate this a bit more, um, let me just, obviously you wouldn't have this in your scene. Just put this in there so we can see it. Okay. 
I'm gonna put an object like right there, okay? Now, also for speed, I'm not gonna render this guy out at that size, because this would take a while to render out. So I'm gonna go like uh, 600 by 4800, or 480, there we go. Okay, so I'm gonna render him out, and I just go up to my rendering menu, and I say render batch render, okay? Now this is what actually renders this out, okay? Before, uh, by clicking on this little button here, it renders it to the viewer, but it's not really saving it anywhere we can get to easily. By going to render batch render, it's actually putting it into our folders. So here is the process for this, where it's just rendering it, our stuff out. Now as it's rendering our stuff out, um, let's say this is an animation, it's gonna take all night long, you can close Maya down and it'll still continue rendering, okay? Um, so that's done, 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 it's all done. So now I'm gonna go into Nuke, and this is the part where um, on Canvas, I've already created this base file for you to use, so you don't have to recreate this, you're just gonna simply use my base file, okay? And it has all this stuff in here, you just need to use this area. And the interface, um, can be a little intimidating at first um, just like every other program you've ever used uh, but it gets easier so um, the moving and scaling and stuff is or zooming is the same thing as Maya except opposite <laughs> so alt right mouse button does this and then alt middle mouse button does this okay <laughs> so what I want to do is I want to find my beauty pass which is right here and I'm gonna double click and I'm gonna just um, go, over, go over here and just load in my new rendering. So my rendering will be inside of my, as long as I've set my project like I showed last time, it'll be inside my folder, inside RenderMan, inside the most recent one, which is there, inside Images, and inside uh, here, just the regular Pokeball, okay? Now to see this, I can just click on it and hit the number one, okay? Any image you want to see, you just click on it and hit the number one. That's all you have to do. Now over here is the depth, so I'm going to double click this one. I'm going to click on the loader, and then I'm going to go to the Z. I clicked on the wrong one. Hold on. Did I? Nope, that's, uh, yes, that's the wrong one. That's the 22nd, 23rd, images, there it is. Okay. So now here's what the depth is. I'm gonna click on this and hit one. Now it looks like this image is just red, okay? But it's not. If I use this little guy here just to see it, it's actually showing me the depth. It's showing me like how far from the camera each point is on that object. If I hover my mouse over any area, you'll see this number changing, okay? That's like literally how far from the camera that object is. So it's 8.8 .8 units. 9.10, 16, 17, 18, and then way back here is infinity, okay? So what this does is it gives us the ability to create depth of field, uh, which is super awesome because then it gives us a little bit of like softness around our object, so it's not like incredibly ugly, okay? So you're loading in three images. This one here, oops, which is your color. This one here, which is your depth, and then the other one is going to be this one, which is your AO. The AO should look something like that, where it's like this black and white image. So we just have to go back to Maya, back to our render settings. We go to sampling. Then under the integrator in sampling, we change this to occlusion. And then we can crank our settings up to maybe like 16 or so. Okay, so now we do another... Oops, Back to my render settings, make sure I change my name. Okay, put an underscore AO, there we go. So now when I do a batch render, it's gonna render that out, just that one file, which is the ambient occlusion. And that ambient occlusion is this black and white image and it adds like a lot of depth to your, um, your object. Okay, so um, look, looks like it's done. So we'll go back to Nuke. I double click my AO, I click on the folder, and then I go back to my folder, images, AO, nope, yes, there we go, all right, 
here. So there's that one, there's my depth, okay. So now I'm gonna come down here um, to the very bottom where it says right, and I'm gonna hit one. And what I should see, oops. Let's reset this, there we go. What I should see is my object is probably out of focus, okay? Inside here, there is a Z to focus node. So I'm just gonna double click this. And then when I do that, I get this little dot, okay? Now my dot is like way up top to the right. Your dot will be right in the center because you rendered it out correctly. So everything else lines up. Because I shrunk mine when I rendered it, it's coming up way far away. So I'm just gonna bring this down. And what it does is it basically says, this is what I want in focus. So if I'm really trying to emphasize like, hey, I want this lens to be in focus, see how I can do that, that's pretty awesome. Um, and then I can just change some of my settings here. So right now my um, size is seven and 100. So I just need to change this down a little bit. And now I'll get um, different stuff in focus. I put it here, you can see that's in focus. There. Okay, so you have a lot of control over that kind of stuff, which is awesome. Okay, now let me switch over to my other one that I had. Oh, come on. Just gonna undo my imports real quick. There we go. So I can get back to the one that I had here already. Where are you at? There's that. There's that. There we go. Just took a second. Okay. So then the other thing that you can change, and I'll just kind of, if you look at the um, before and after, you can see how it softens that edge, making it just feel, um, feel a little bit more like a photo of this as opposed to just a 3D object. And that's the idea with depth of field, is it makes it feel more realistic. And then the idea with the ambient occlusion, let's look at it right here, is if I disable this, There it is disabled and re-enabled. Do you see how we get this like darkness right here on like the creases? So that ambient occlusion adds that level of depth to it that we otherwise wouldn't have. Okay. So then I'm gonna come back down here, um, back to my right, there we go. So if you don't like the color that is with your background, you can go over here to the constant and you just double click it. And then you can just pick a different color. You want red, you want green, you want something from this area, whatever, okay? Then all we have to do is just go to the right and just tell it where you wanna go. So you just click on a folder, tell it where you want it to go, 2520 W17, product, oops, images, sarcona underscore pokeball underscore final dot tiff. And then you would hit the render button. And what this does is kind of like what Maya does, where it takes all the information and then actually makes a file. It's doing the same thing. It's taking all those different nodes that we did, compressing it into one file so that you can view it outside of the software. And you can see even this isn't a fast process. This is gonna take a minute for it to actually save that, that project out, okay? Now in this project, I've kind of done the work for you of what needs to happen inside of Nuke as far as the base stuff. Okay, so all you're doing is just opening up this file, getting it from Canvas, obviously, um, and then reloading the AO here, reloading the beauty, reloading the depth, picking your Z to focused area, changing the color here if you want, and then writing it out, okay? But all this other stuff you'll learn as we get into the class. So don't be like intimidated by it now. It's actually like, as far as Nuke goes, it's like the simple side of Nuke. Okay, so once you're done with all of this, you're going to turn in your whole project folder. So you'll turn in your project folder right there, whatever your name is, and you'll drop it into, I don't have it on this computer or that computer because they're both work, not working, uh, but the um, Z drive, it'll have a folder inside the 2520 that says Pokeball turn in, and you'll just drop your folder into the Pokeball turn in. And then I should be able to go into your images folder 
and find your final Pokeball turn in. Looks much better with the blue. And it should be a 3000 by 2400 pixel image. Um, if you want to add your title here, look at that. Add an author. How we get fancy. <laughs> I don't know what happened there. Huh, just got rid of it. There we go. Stayed that time. Cool. Okay, so um, today your goal should be to get your stuff into Mari if you haven't done so already. The texture doesn't have to be incredibly complex. It could just be just like I had before, or two different colors, top and bottom, the middle, the, the lens area here, and then just adding some metal in other areas, right? That's as simple as it needs to be. Um, obviously, if you want to really understand the tool more, you want to push it and kind of do a little bit more stuff to it, okay? Yeah, that one turned out pretty good. Um, you could even add other stuff to your character if you wanted to also, just to kind of show this. Maybe I did already show this, maybe not. Um, you can duplicate your shell, and then you can grab pieces of it. And then you could you know, delete everything else. And then you could just extrude and just like pull that up. And then what I do is just put it back on it. There we go. Now he has like something there. Now obviously this piece I wouldn't want to just leave like that. I'd actually want to like Mari it or UV it and then Mari it. I wouldn't just drop it in. But just for fun for future stuff, that's definitely something you could do after you add some bevels to it. Oh, I thought you just did that while you're creating the What was that? I thought you could you just did that while you were creating the ball. Right, that's what I'm saying you'd oh, want to okay, do. So I'm sorry. Yep. Yeah, you'd want to do that before you brought it into Mari. That way you have all the pieces there. Okay, cool. Um, awesome. 